As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Hey, welcome to Home Group. This is Rick Renner, and tonight we're just sitting here having fun, waiting for you to join us for Home Group. And the we is me and Denise and Paul and Joel Renner. Hi, guys. We're so glad everybody's with us tonight. It's great to be here together. And Home Group, we are so glad that you're with us. Amen. Mom, I have a question. You know, me and you did a lot of listening last night. Yeah. And that teaching, I thought it was just wonderful. How the church can be so diverse. It was really wonderful. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Mama, what did you get out of last night's teaching? Well, I got out of last night's teaching the word now mm -hmm. because that the Holy Spirit, he's so aware of what goes on mm -hmm. and, and what goes on in our lives. I'm sure he says, oh, now, now they got it. Oh, now they're healed. Oh, now they've repented. I mean, the Holy Spirit, he's excited about the things that happen in our lives. Honey, that is so awesome. Well, and I saw, I love that, that you said that about now. Paul, what did you get out of last night? I think it's very interesting that Paul joined a church before he started churches. He joined a team and he was in the right place at the right time where for our entire year, he learned and served along with other people. Mm -hmm. Because so many people want to do their own thing. They want to start their ministry. Without ever learning to serve or be a member of a church. Paul was educated. He had experience. He had leadership capability. Actually, he was a theologian. But he needed to be in the church. He did. And one year in one location for Paul is a long time. He was a smart guy. He picked up on things really fast. But one year at that time mm -hmm. for such a young church... Mm -hmm. That would have been a long time. I mean, if you were in the church for a year at that time, you could have already been a leader. That was a long time to be in a church at that time. Well, you know, he tells us his own testimony in the book of Galatians. He says that he was taught by the revelation of Jesus Christ for three years. He was out in the wilderness of Arabia. It's what he says. So for three years, think about this. Paul is taught by Jesus himself. He has a revelation of the church. So there he is in Tarsus where there is no church. He's not connected to any believers that we know of, loaded with a revelation. Listen to this, guys. A revelation of the church, but he has no relationship with the church. And before the Holy Spirit sends him out, first he has to learn how to take all that knowledge and make it work in the local church. He had to become a member of a church and serve just like everybody else. Even though he was a theologian, he had more revelation than anybody else. He could not sidestep joining a church and serving in a church. That was a requirement. And guess what? Before he was launched out into his own ministry, he served in one local church in Antioch. You know how long? About eight years. Eight years? About eight years of his life before he launched out into apostolic ministry. He went to church. He served in church. He was a member of a local church staff for about eight years. Wow. Isn't that amazing? But hey, we're offering you the whole series, which is free. This download of this study guide is free. Being in the right place at the right time. You say, is it really possible to be in the right place at the right time? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when you're in the right place at the right thing, time, things just begin to supernaturally come together for you. And this week in the regular TV program, we're offering you the whole series by the same name. And we're also offering you my book called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success, Positioning Yourself to Live in God's Supernatural Power, Provision, and Protection. But hey, if you need prayer, I want you to remember that we're here for you. You can send us your prayer request at prayer at renner.org or call us at 1-800-742-5593, and we will really pray for you. But guys, let's go back to Acts chapter 13, to that word now that Denise was ta talking about. Well, I'll go right now to that. All right, let's go there. <laughs> and in Greek, the word now is the word day, which in Greek is something very categorical. It's like the Holy Spirit's raising his voice and saying, now... He's emphasizing the point. He is so excited about what's happening in Antioch. You know why? Because it hasn't happened anywhere else. Something brand new is happening in Antioch. 
Guess what's happening? The new man is being created in Antioch. It is totally different than what's going on in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the church is Jewish and they have a lot of Jewish problems. They're still wondering if everybody needs to be circumcised. Do they need to keep the law? They're very hung up on Jewish things in the city of Jerusalem and very quickly the church in Jerusalem, and please don't be offended by me. I'm not anti-Jewish. I love the Jew. I've got some Jewish blood myself. But the church in Jerusalem was clinging to old things. And even though that's where it all started, Pentecost started there, a move of God started there. Very quickly, they became an old wineskin. What is an old wineskin? Something that is inflexible, unable to move with the spirit. They were stuck in tradition. They were stuck in culture. And God wanted to do something new. God wanted to reach the whole world. So guess what happened? The hub of the Holy Spirit moved from Jerusalem all the way north to Antioch. Now, I think that's amazing because that's a huge distance in the first century, which means God moved his main activity so far north that those that were stuck in the past couldn't get there to mess with it. Very disconnected. Very disconnected. And in Antioch, something marvelous began to take place. And that's why the Holy Spirit begins, like Denise said, in chapter 13, verse 1, with the word now, the Greek word day. It's an exclamation mark. Now, do, 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 do. Here it is. There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Mannion, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Today, we're going to look at the really unique mix of leadership that was in this church. Wow, this is just amazing. But I want you to remember the word N. We saw last night the Greek word kata carries the idea of domination. These prophets and teachers were dominating in the church, which was at Antioch. And in fact, when the Bible uses the word were, the word were, is the Greek word usen, which carries the idea of something existing or even flourishing. The church of Antioch was just flourishing. Marvelous things were happening there. And the Bible says there were prophets and teachers. Well, what is a prophet? Well, the word prophet is the Greek word prophetes, and it carries four meanings. And I want to give you guys all four of them, and I want you to understand what is a prophet. If you want to know more about fivefold ministry, I have a series which we offer on our website store called Understanding Fivefold Ministry. You should go there and you should order. But the word prophetes, you guys with me? Mm -hmm. It's a compound of two Greek words. Is that a surprise? The word pro means before. The second part of the word is fami. The word fami means to speak or to say. When you compound the two words together, pro and fami, it forms prophetes, which is translated as prophet. So the real important part of this word is the word fami, which means to speak or to say, which means a prophetic gift is a speaking or saying gift. It's a gift that speaks. But the word pro is really important. Where does a prophet speak? Well, the word pro is the answer. And the word pro carries four ideas. So stay with me. And I want to know what you're learning tonight. Number one, the word pro means before. The first thing it tells us is before a prophet speaks before people, first he speaks before God. A prophet's primary position is not public. It is before God. And in the presence of God, a prophet speaks with God. A prophet listens to God. This word pro, fami, in this particular context depicts a prophet's position before God. But secondly, the word pro also describes a prophet's position in front of people. This is a public gift. This is a gift that is in front of people. A prophet is a spokesman on behalf of God. Number three, that leads us to number three. The word pro can be translated on behalf of. So when a prophet finally stands in front of the people, he speaks on behalf of the one who spoke to him, or he speaks on behalf of the Lord. The prophet doesn't speak. 
unless he heard God say something. That's why point number one is so important. That his primary job is to be probed before the Lord. Once he receives something from the Lord, then he moves publicly pro before the people. And when he's in front of the people pro, he begins to speak on behalf of what he heard from the Lord. And then you come to number four, the word pro can also describe something that is done in advance, which describes the predictive ability of a prophet, or a prophet is one who can speak in advance. Did you learn anything about the role of a prophet? That means that it's not always prophetic in the sense of speaking about things to come. No. It could be about speaking about things that pertain to the moment right now. And truthfully, when you understand the word prophetes, prophet, the prophet is silent more than he is speaking because his first priority is prophetes, to be before the Lord and to be speaking before the Lord. A prophet may be quiet for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Then when he has something to say, he is dispatched to fulfill these other responsibilities. Well, Denise. look at Elijah. I mean, he, we don't know how much time he was by himself. But when he was in front of the people or in front of leaders or anointing a king, he was powerful. And, and I think, <clears throat> Rick, that in all that quiet and all that seeking, that <clears throat> God is preparing that prophet to speak. Oh, absolutely. It's not wasted time. Oh, no, it's all preparation. That's what it is. <clears throat> Joel? Well, I think that first of all, the prophet is representing God. So he has to spend time with God. And I think that's what you were just saying, Mom. Yes. To, to represent God, you have to know him. You have to spend time with him. And I think that's very, very good. That's very important. Now, I've already told you that in Acts 13, <coughs> verse 1, the Bible says that there were certain prophets and teachers, and the Greek here implies they were flourishing in Antioch. But when you go to Acts 11, verse 27 and 28, we read something else very interesting. We read that in Antioch, there was a whole company of prophets that included much more than what we read in Acts 13, verse 1. Listen to what it says in Acts 11, 27 to 28. And in these days came prophets. How many? Many. Plural. It was a whole company of prophets from Antioch. And where did they come? They came to Jerusalem, and there stood up one of them named Agabus. Agabus is not mentioned in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. He's mentioned before we ever get to Acts chapter 13. So there was a whole company of prophets that were flourishing in the city of Antioch, and notice that they are speaking by the Spirit. That also is very important. It says, and signified by the Spirit. By the Spirit means through the instrumentality of the Spirit. He didn't speak on his own behalf. This wasn't his own natural gift. This was something by the Spirit operating through him. And what did he do? He began to speak prophetically or predictive of the future. But let's go back to chapter 13, verse 1, because it goes on to say that there were prophets and teachers. The word teachers is the Greek word didaskalos. Ay, ay, ay. The word didaskalos, and by the way, here in Greek it is plural. So there wasn't one teacher, it was teachers, plural. The word didaskalos, here translated teacher, depicts one who is a fabulous, masterful teacher. It is the Greek equivalent for the word rabbi. Now, if you want to know more about the fivefold ministry gift teacher, get that series on our website called Understanding Fivefold Ministry because I really dive into what it means to be a New Testament teacher. But let's go on in this verse. It says that among the leaders in Antioch, there were these men, Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manion, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Hmm, very interesting. Well, let me read to you from my book called the will of God, the key to your success. Listen to this. One of the main factors that made the church of Antioch such a great environment was the diversity of its spiritual leadership. With the addition of Saul and his ministry partner Barnabas, there was a healthy range of ages among those in position of authority. That's interesting because some of them were younger, some of them were older. This is significant. Paul, I'd like to have your comment on this. Because younger and older leaders all bring something unique to the table. Isn't that the truth? 
For a ministry to function effectively, it is important to have both. Young leaders are often more open to new ideas and are flexible concerning the fresh move of God's Spirit. And as such, they bring a much needed vitality to the body of Christ. But on the other hand, older leaders bring rock solid stability, experience, and a firmer understanding of the Word of God. Balance is very important when it comes to spiritual leadership. If there are too many young leaders in a church, Oh my goodness, this is powerful. If there are too many young leaders in a church, that congregation can become imbalanced, unstable, and immature. On the other hand, too many older leaders can cause a church to become limited by a strict adherence to tradition and an unwillingness to try or to change new things. But having the right mix of young and old leaders will bring life, vitality, and stability to the church, making it feel fresh and exciting and doctrinally sound, and the church in Antioch was just a mixture like this of social classes, education, and age. Is that amazing? I want to say something. Sure. Because the church is a family. And, you know, when you get together with your family, maybe at Christmas or Thanksgiving, it, I mean, it's wonderful when the grandparents are there, the parents are there, the grandchildren are there, because you get the mix of the old and the young. And it's wonderful. And I think it's the same in the church, Rick, because we are the family of God. Paul? Amen. I agree. There's so much that we can share and so much that we can give each other. Time after time in the Bible, we see that our faith is, it's generational. It's something that we pass from one generation to the next, and especially truth, truth and promises. So often it's the next generation that gets to see the promise actually happen. We see that in the Old Testament time and time again. We get to see that the next generation, the ones that see the the promises actually being fulfilled. So you have to stick with it and you have to pass on that truth. So there should be a connection between the generations and there's a challenge. Uh, I read a study once about serving young people. and About what? Serving younger people. And the, the study started out with the phrase, said the church is always on the brink of extinction. And I didn't like it when I read that first, because it didn't sound right. The church is supposed to last forever. I mean, there's nothing that can, uh, that can affect the church or the existence of the church on the earth. But then when you think about it a little bit, the church is always on the brink of extinction. If we don't pass our faith to the next generation. That is fabulous. But then we're gone. Yeah. So it's not about us. It's about passing on our faith. But think about it. In Antioch, if it was all older leaders, then probably it would have been stuck. If it was all younger leaders, it would have been mature. You have to have a balance between old and young in every church. But I want us to go on. Look at this. I want us to look at who were these men that are mentioned in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. And forgive me for reading, but I can't improve on what I've written here, and I don't want to miss anything. First, Barnabas. Who was Barnabas? Barnabas was a Levite from the Gentile country of Cyprus, which was a region in Greece. He was a distant Jew, descended from the tribe of Levi, because he was raised so far from Jerusalem, it is likely he did not grow up around the strict religious environment that was so characteristic of Jerusalem. So he was a non-religious Jew and he was a businessman. He was a businessman. He was not theologically trained. Second, Simeon. Simeon is referred to in scripture as Niger, which is the Latin word for black. Interesting that in Russian, it is the very word for black. Still, we still use that word. Scholars speculate this indicates Simon was probably a black man from Africa and may have been the slave of a Roman family. I say may, just to be kind, most believe he was a Roman, a slave of a Roman family. Regardless, He served in a position of authority in the church of Antioch. Slaves did not serve in positions of authority. They just did not. Number three, Lucius of Cyrene was from the region of Cyrene, again in northern Africa. And some speculate this may have been Luke. It was not Luke. Others argue that this was a man of North African heritage. The name Lucius actually means light or bright. 
So there are many who speculate, and I personally do, that this was a a light-colored black man from North Africa. Regardless of the identity of this man, it seems he had come to Antioch from Northern Africa, and there are many scholars who believe this was another slave who had been assimilated into a Roman home. Mm. Then you come to Mannion. Mannion is recorded to have been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and was, in fact, probably a relative of the family of Herod. This was a Roman. This was royalty. Because Mannion was Roman and likely descended from the royal family, he had received a Roman education. This is especially significant because educated Romans were trained to look down on foreigners as being uncouth barbarians who were less than them. Mannion's position alongside other ethnicities and skin colors, <laughs> lets us know that he had broken free from prejudices of his upbringing to work alongside of two Africans and two Jews who were on the same team with him. That was unthinkable. Finally, you come to the last leader, who is Saul, who we later know as the Apostle Paul. Saul was born into a very well-connected, tremendously wealthy Jewish family, who were also Roman citizens. Being raised in a wealthy home, he was afforded the best education that money could buy. He was also theologically trained for his position as a rabbi and Pharisee. He was the most religiously instructed and possessed the greatest breadth of scriptural knowledge of any of his peers in the team of Antioch. And to assemble this group in the first century, broke all norms of society and was truly a supernatural situation that only God could arrange. And by directing Saul to Antioch, the Holy Spirit placed him in the right place at the right time in a multi-racial environment where he could learn to serve side by side with Gentiles and Jews alike. And that's why chapter 13, verse 1, begins with the word now, the Greek word day. Wow, 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 listen to this. This is amazing. What happened in Antioch had never happened before. It just had never happened before. Now, I have to read one more thing. May I, guys? Sure. Of course. Listen to this. Saul provided the congregation of Antioch with the solid foundation of the Word of God and... He was able to bring years of study in Jewish heritage to the table. Having him on their teaching staff gave the believers in Antioch unprecedented access to an expert on Jewish culture and to the Old Testament. Whether the subject was the story of creation, the Old Testament covenants, praise and worship, Jesus' lineage, messianic prophecies, the Shekinah glory of God, or simply Jewish history, all of this was comfortable territory for Saul of Tarsus. And as a trained rabbi and theologian, he was like a fish in water when it came to the Old Testament. It is not difficult to imagine how expanding on the Old Testament in a thorough and balanced manner, would have quickly become his niche in the church. And his role in the church became very valuable because he was really the only one in the church trained theologically. Well, think about it. Barnabas was a non-religious Jew. Simeon was a black man, a slave, Lucius, probably a light-colored black man from northern Africa who had been assimilated into a Roman environment. Mannion, who was a Roman who had been raised as a pagan. He was a relative of Herod. Very, very educated. What in the world were all these people doing in one room serving at the same table together? This just culturally could not take place. But God did it in Antioch. And in Antioch, all those colors... All those race distinctions, ethnicities, nationalities just evaporated in Christ. Now, when they left the church, they were still different colors. They were still different nationalities. But when they walked into the church, those things evaporated. That can only happen in the church. Church. Is that amazing? It's amazing. You know, Rick, I remember years ago when we used to live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we would listen to Bob Yandian sometimes. And he, and I was there more than Rick was because Rick was on the road a lot. But he would say, 
all you lawyers, all you doctors, all you teachers, all you people who work for the city, whatever your vocation is, you leave it outside the door. When you walk inside the church, you are the body of Christ. You are saved. You are called out. You are washed. And and he he really made a distinction that when we came into Christ, that we were the body of Christ and all the other labels, they disappeared. You know, a lot of people talk about, of course, we live in Russia. So people talk about the Russian church, the Ukrainian church, the black church, the white church, the Gentile church, the Jewish church. Can I tell you something? There's no such thing. There's no such thing. There is the church. There's just the church. We may speak Russian. We may speak English. But there's no such thing as a white church, a black church. We are the church of the living God. And Antioch is where God created this. It's where God did it. And the Holy Spirit got so excited about it. That Acts 13 verse 1, he begins with the Greek word day translated out. Now, listen to this. This is really powerful. Wow. Here's what happened in Antioch. And that was the right place for Paul to be trained. He could have gone to Jerusalem. It was probably more attractive for him to go to Jerusalem because he was a Jew. And you know what? It would have made more sense, actually. His gift would have flourished in Jerusalem. They would have loved him because he was so theologically trained. But in Jerusalem, he would have never learned one thing about working with Gentiles. He would have never learned one thing about dropping his prejudices and becoming more open-minded. He would have been in an environment where he would have been trapped culturally, trapped in his thinking. It would not have prepared him for Gentile ministry. So the Holy Spirit, actually, if you study the whole story, the Holy Spirit removed him from Jerusalem, <laughs> removed him and plopped him in Antioch. And you know what? I just imagine that when he first came to Antioch, he had to get over a few things. Because he was trained not to like Gentiles. And now he's serving side by side with Gentiles. People of different skin colors. He's serving with a Roman Manian. <laughs> he is mixed in such a diverse group of leaders. It's where he needed to be. And sometimes the Holy Spirit puts you places where you're not exactly comfortable. It's okay. Get everything you can get from it. It might be the right place and the right time to prepare you for the next step in your life. It's amazing. God can use any place you're in right now to get you ready for the next step. Have you guys enjoyed tonight? Very oh, much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Joe, would you pray for our home group tonight? Let's hold hands. Amen. Mm -hmm. Father God, I ask you to bless our home group. I ask you to give us good sleep tonight. Mm -hmm. In the name of Jesus Christ, be with our partners, Jesus. Be with every single one of them. Father God, if we need healing in our lives, I ask you to bring it to our homes. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We're out of time. We'll see you tomorrow night. Bye-bye. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.